Lord, be with us now as we turn to your word. Lord, give us eyes to see the truth in your word. Give us ears to hear your voice speaking to us. And Lord, soften our hearts. Or that after seeing with our eyes and hearing with our ears, we might have the humility to submit our lives to the truth of your word and live differently because of it. We thank you and we praise you when he asks us all in Jesus' name so we know you hear us. Amen. You can be seated. Luke chapter 5. We're going to continue in the book of Luke as we investigate Jesus as he shares the gospel, the good news for the entire world. Ultimately, the whole of the Bible points, points to Jesus, points to his work, his death, and his resurrection. I think we'll see that today in Luke chapter 5. But as we begin, the question is this. How does Jesus choose his disciples? How does God choose those who will serve him? How does God select those who will carry forth his mission in his plan on the earth? Well, if we look back across the the story of Scripture, we go all the way back to the beginning. We see this man called Abraham, right? Abraham was the father of the nation of Israel. His name means father of many. But why did God choose Abraham? I mean, if we really look at Abraham, we see that he was kind of a coward. He was a liar. He was a worshiper of foreign gods. But, I mean, not just Abraham. If you go forward a few generations, you see Jacob. Jacob's the one who, whose name was changed to Israel. He was the, the namesake of the people of God, the father of the 12 tribes. But Jacob was a deceiver, a heel grabber, one who deceived his brother out of his birthright and his blessing through lying and deception. It doesn't just stop there. Look, at, look forward several generations to Moses. Moses was the one who God chose to lead the people out of slavery in Egypt. But who was Moses? He was a murderer, a stutterer. He was the one, that, the one who couldn't speak well, was the one God chose to be the mouthpiece of his people. It doesn't just stop there. If you go forward, you read about the women who were in the genealogy of Jesus Christ, Jesus' great, great, and so on, grandmothers. You've got Rahab, the prostitute from Jericho. You've got Ruth, the Moabitess, the foreigner, the one who, had, who was from a foreign land, who was barren. Even if we keep going forward, we see that the heart of God is to choose those who are unlikely. Think about the Apostle Paul who wrote a vast majority of the New Testament. He was one who persecuted Christians. Not only was he outside, he didn't believe in Jesus, but he persecuted, he tried to throw Christians, those who professed faith in Christ, in prison and drive them out of town. God chose him to be the one to take the good news of the gospel of Jesus to the Gentiles. Not only to those who didn't worship God like he did, but those who didn't even know God. You see, throughout Scripture, we see that the heart of God is to choose those who are the least likely. He doesn't choose the the shiniest and best, but He chooses those who He wills so that He can receive glory. I can't say it any better than than Pastor Shai Lin said it. He said, His, that is God's amazing plan, made His hands save Abraham from a pagan land. Who can argue with the people that God chooses, Israel and not Egypt, Peter and not Judas? Humanly speaking, it should have been Saul and not David. The inheritance should have been Esau's and not Jacob's. The truth, it speaks so brightly so we can see rightly a huge and mighty God who chooses the least likely. Friends, I hope today in our text we will see that Jesus demonstrates the nature of his mission to save sinners through his call of Levi the tax collector and his response to the critique of the the Pharisees. Friends, it is Jesus' mission to call sinners to think rightly about their sin and be saved by the grace of Jesus. And I hope that by the end of our time today, we would recognize our own sin. That we were those who needed to be saved. And that we will be encouraged, equipped, and ready to go out and share that good news that has changed our lives with others. Would you pray with me once again and then we'll read from God's word. Lord, in this time we 
recognize that this is your word and not ours, or this is your book and not ours, your time and not ours, your church, not ours. So Lord, as we spend time in your word today, Lord, may these be your words and not mine. Father, I pray with the psalmist, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock, and my redeemer. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear. Lord, help us to understand rightly your word so that we might live in a way that honors you. We pray this in Jesus' name so we know you hear us. Amen. Luke chapter 5, beginning in verse 27. This is God's word. After this, Jesus went out and saw a tax collector named Levi sitting at a tax office. And he said to him, follow me. So leaving everything behind, he got up and began to follow him. Levi hosted a grand banquet for him at his house. Now there was a large crowd of tax collectors and others who were reclining at the table with them. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus replied to them, It is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is the word of the Lord, and we thank God for it. Three aspects in our text today, three truths I want us to to recognize. The first is this. This is Levi's response. Levi's response. Response. Jesus had been ministering throughout the the ancient world of Israel. He had started in Galilee and had come down to Judah. Last week we read the story of Jesus teaching in a house that was so full that no one could get in. And as he's leaving there, as he's continuing his preaching tour, proclaiming the good news about the kingdom of God, he comes to a certain place and sees a certain tax booth. And in it there is a tax collector named Levi. Now, just to be clear here, this person named Levi is the person we often refer to as Matthew, the guy who wrote the gospel. Same person, just two different names. It was very common, especially for tax collectors, to have a Hebrew name Levi and a Greek name Matthew. So Matthew, Levi, this guy we're talking about was a tax collector. And let's just be clear about who this guy is. We're not told a lot about his family, about his background, about his appearance. We're not told about his his hobbies or his accent, but we are told his occupation. He was a tax collector. Now, I know we're in the middle of tax season. If you haven't done your taxes yet, that deadline's coming up fast. But this is not quite what we do today. In the ancient world, tax collectors were those who collected taxes on behalf of the Romans. We need to remember where we are in history. In the first century in the Middle East here, this is under the the thumb of the Roman Empire. It has grown to be the, the largest empire in the Western world at the time. And first century Israel was ruled under the thumb of the Romans. This was a foreign pagan government. By that I mean this is not a government made up of people who lived around. This was not a Jewish government. This wasn't people who honored God, but this was a foreign government ruled by Rome in Italy, thousands of miles away. And it was a pagan government. These were not people that honored the God of Israel. They didn't worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. These were people who worshiped various gods in various different ways through various immoral actions in various temples. And I say all of that to get to this point. When we say that Matthew or Levi was a tax collector, he is not collecting taxes for things that are going to be of benefit to the people. These are taxes that are going to get shipped off to Rome. Taxes that are going to be used for this foreign pagan government to fight its wars, to expand its influence, to continue to oppress the people under its thumb. For a Jew to be a tax collector in the first century was tantamount to them turning their back on their own people. For in their own perspective, this guy had turned his back on his family and was working for the bad guys. He was collecting taxes for the Roman establishment to continue oppressing the people and if that's not bad enough let's go one layer deeper you see tax collectors got these jobs because they bid for them they they bought these jobs literally from the romans so he applied for this he wasn't conscripted to this and on top of all of that the way that taxpayers or tax collectors got rich was not through the money that the the government paid them but they would take a little bit off the top say you owed the roman government a hundred dollars Levi would come in and say, you owe me $150, and he would pay Rome 100 and pocket the rest. So not only was 
he one who turned his back on his people. Not only was he one who, who was not was working for the bad guys, but he was also a thief. Tax collectors were not thought of well in this society. So you need to understand all of this because when Luke writes that Jesus came and saw a tax collector at his collection booth and called him to follow him, they would have thought about all this baggage. They would have been thinking, why in the world is Jesus, the Messiah, the righteous one, the one who says he's come to proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, associating with this tax collector? He's abandoned his people. This is the scum of the earth. Why is Jesus calling him? But look what happens. Jesus walks by his tax booth and sees him there, and he says two words. It's all that's recorded here. Follow me. And what does Levi do? It says that he leaves everything behind and follows Jesus. This is the pattern that's been set up. Just a few weeks ago, we talked about the call of Simon or Peter and his brother Andrew and James and John. They were out fishing, and and Jesus performed a miracle, and he told them, follow me, I'm going to make you fishers of men. And what did they do? They left everything. They left their nets and their boats right there and followed Jesus. This tax collector, someone who had turned his back on his people, who was separated from the broader Jewish society, when Jesus bids him to come, he stands up, leaves his tax booth, his very lucrative profession, and gives his life to follow Jesus. Think about what a miracle that was for Jesus to call Levi. The miracle is that Jesus looked past his sins, looked past his failures, looked past his flaws, and called him to follow Jesus. And we know Matthew became the disciple who walked with Jesus, who saw Jesus perform miracles, even recorded an account of Jesus' life. The call of Levi was a miracle because Jesus looked past his sins, and called him to be one of his own. John Calvin, a pastor from the Middle Ages, wrote this about Levi. He said, But this tax collector, who followed an occupation little esteemed and involved in many abuses, was selected for additional reasons, that he might be an example of Christ's undeserved goodness, that he might show in his person that the calling of all of us depends not on the merits of our own righteousness, but on that of His, that is Christ's pure kindness. Matthew, therefore, was not only a witness and a preacher, but was a proof and illustration of the grace exhibited by Christ. Friends, Matthew was an example of Jesus' grace. For though his sins were many, though he was totally undeserving of walking with Jesus, Jesus called him anyway called him out of his sin and into a relationship with him. But not only that, Matthew is called, he leaves everything and follows Jesus, but then what does he do? He throws a party at his house for Jesus and invites all of his tax collector friends. Matthew was so excited that Jesus had selected him, that Jesus had called him out of that lifestyle, that he had restored him and given him dignity, that he wanted all of his other friends to meet Jesus as well. We talked about this a little bit last week with the four friends who brought their paralyzed friend to Jesus, right? When we see Jesus, when we hear about Jesus doing something amazing, we get to share that truth with others. We can't make our friends believe the gospel, but we can make sure that they hear about Jesus. Friends, if I can give you a little bit of application here in the beginning, a little piece of what this text tells for us to do today. We need to start with this. We need to follow the example of Matthew. When Jesus calls, when Jesus bids us to come and follow him, we should respond like Levi, to leave everything and follow him. To leave everything behind and follow him. I said this a few weeks ago, I'll say it again. Oftentimes today when Christ calls us to be his disciple, he doesn't call us to leave our occupations or our jobs, though he might. But what he does call us to do is to leave everything behind from our former way of life. To be willing to lay everything down, our relationships, our jobs, our old habits, 
the old things that brought us comfort, the old ways that we thought sought to be good in the eyes of others, to leave all that behind to follow Jesus completely and totally. Friends, if we have been called to salvation, called to be a disciple of Jesus, we have been called to give our entire lives to Him. We are called to be willing to forsake everything for the sake of following Jesus. Friends, if we know the salvation of God, if we know the love of the Father, the sacrifice of the Son, the new life given through the Spirit, then we know that we are called to forsake all things and follow Christ. This is what we celebrate on Resurrection Day, right? This is that Jesus sacrificed his life for us in our place and then rose again from the dead, guaranteeing that we can have new life because we are in him. Friends, we must not forget that we are Levi. We must not forget that we, you and I, are outcasts, separated from God because of our sins. That like Levi, we are separated from God because, just like he was separated from society because of the sin in our life. Those things that we think, say, and do that separate us from God, that go against his good plan. And we are like Levi, called to follow Christ, not because of the good things that we have done, not because we were good enough, not because we did the right things or said the right words. The reason that we are Christians is because God has saved us from our sins. Just like he called Levi, he also calls us. And just like Levi, friends, we should seek to influence others for the sake of the gospel, to share the good news of Jesus with others. Don't you just love that sound? So we see Matthew's response. But next, see the Pharisees' resistance. Look at verse 30. But the Pharisees and their scribes were complaining to his disciples. Why do you eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners? Jesus is at this party at Levi's house, and it's Levi's friends, right? He was a tax collector. They didn't hang out with other Jews. They hung out with other tax collectors and also those who were set outside of normal society, those who, because of their occupations or their choices, were not a part of regular good Jewish society. So Jesus is at this party, hanging out with the outcasts and sinners. And while he is there, while he's talking and sharing a meal, the Pharisees come along. The ultra-religious crowd. Remember the Pharisees, they're not just like regular religious observers. They don't just go to the temple and worship God. These are the people who think that they have a monopoly on the worship of God. They believe that they are the only ones who follow the law correctly. They are the only ones who worship God like he should be worshipped. So they come and they talk to one of Jesus' disciples, kind of sticking their nose up. Why in the world are you eating and drinking with tax collectors and sinners? The implication is this, right? If Jesus truly is the righteous man he claims to be, if Jesus really is the Messiah, then he would be hanging out with the Pharisees and not with the tax collectors and sinners. Friends, I think what we need to draw from this is that we need to be careful to not be like the Pharisees. The Pharisees were on their proverbial high horse looking down at Jesus and his friends. And friends, if I'm honest, it's amazing how fast I can find myself in this same situation. It's amazing how fast I find my heart going from one who knows my sin and knows the great grace that I've received to finding myself thinking about others being like, man, they're too far gone. They're not worth my conversation. They're too far gone. They're into that, that other stuff. God really couldn't save them. They would never want to hear about the Lord. It's amazing how fast we as Christians can go from those who are broken over our sin and recognition that Jesus is our only hope to thinking that others are too far gone to thinking that we're better than others. Friends, we must take time to remember that the gospel, the good news about Jesus, is good news for us, too. 
The gospel is not just the starting place on the Christian life. The gospel is the whole of the Christian life. The good news is that God loves sinful humanity that had rebelled against Him so much that He sent Jesus, God in the flesh, to live a perfect life, never sinning, never rebelling, to live it for us, then to die a death on the cross in our place, taking the penalty that we deserved, that I deserved, that you deserved, Dying a true death, making satisfaction for our sins, and then rising from the dead, showing that the check had cleared, that the payment was indeed in full, that we are guaranteed new life if we are in Christ. The good news is that we are sinners and we have a great Savior. I think what happens when we become pharisaical in our thoughts and actions is that we forget that good news in our life. We forget that we are sinners in need of grace. We forget that we didn't earn our salvation. That the reason we're saved is not because we said the right thing or wore the right clothes or went to the right places. The reason we're saved is not because we've done enough good works, that we've been to church enough time, that we've read enough books. The reason we're saved is because Jesus has saved us. It's His grace and His grace alone. And when we forget that, That's when we become like the Pharisees looking down our noses at others thinking God can't save them because they're too far gone. Friends, as long as there is breath in our lungs, there is an opportunity for someone to know Jesus Christ. This is good news for us today, but it's also good news for our friends and our family. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we all know someone in our life that is far from God, that doesn't know Him, that's running, that's engaging in 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 activities that that are sinful and they don't want to return friends don't ever think we must repent from thinking that they are too far gone for if jesus would eat and drink with tax collectors and sinners then he would eat and drink with those who are running from god today too if jesus can save those who rejected him in the first century then he can save those who reject him today what we are called to do is to repent of our sins and trust in him as lord Friends, if Jesus can save a tax collector like Levi who turned his back on his people and swindled them out of who knows how much money, if he can save a Pharisee like Nicodemus, then Jesus can save anyone who calls upon his name. It's not about being good enough. It's not about having the right appearance or saying the right words. Friends, Jesus can save tax collectors. He can save Pharisees. He can save liars and greedy. He can save gossips and those who commit tax fraud, those who are prideful, those who are lazy, those who reject God's standards for sexuality. God can save anyone who calls upon Him. Today, let's repent of the Pharisaical idea that there are some that are too far gone for God. Let us repent of those times when we have looked upon those as unworthy of God's grace. For we are all unworthy of God's grace. Let us be reminded it's not an us versus them. Friends, Jesus can save anyone who calls upon his name. Maybe you're here and you're not the Pharisee. You, re- you find yourself here. And you're like the tax collectors. You realize that you are far from God. Well, friends, look at what's next. We see Matthew's repentance. The message that Jesus proclaimed of repentance. Look at verse 31. Jesus replied to them, that's the Pharisees. He said, it is not those who are healthy who need a doctor, but those who are sick. I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Jesus responds to the Pharisees. He does not let them continue in their delusion that he's doing anything wrong. But instead, he shows them his purpose. He gives them this teaching. He says, it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but it's the sick. It's not the healthy that need a doctor, it's the sick. Anytime we see an ambulance running down the road or we hear those sirens, we don't assume that it's going to someone who is happy and healthy and functioning perfectly in life. No, we assume it's someone who is sick or injured. 
If we're in the hospital and we see a group of doctors rushing to someone's room, we don't assume, man, that person must be really good and they're happy to see him. Jesus said it's not the healthy that need a doctor, but the sick. He says, I haven't come to call the righteous, but sinners. Once again, Jesus makes this comparison between sickness and sin. Friends, sin is something that is amiss in who we are. Let me say that a different way. Sin is something that humans were not designed to do. God created humans in his image. That's what we read in Genesis chapter 1. That humankind, male and female, were created in his image. What does that mean? That means we were designed to reflect God's glory to all of creation. We were designed to follow God, to show his power and his authority as we rule and reign over creation. But when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned against God, rebelling against him, doing it, the exact opposite of what he said. They introduced something into humanity that was not designed to be there. That is sin. Rebellion against God. And that's not just in their lives. It's not just their fault. But Paul tells us in Romans 3 that all have sinned. We have all fallen short of God's glory. That means that we are all infected with the sickness of sin. The sickness of sin is not like physical sickness that might cause fatigue or be contagious so that we can't go to our job, but the, the symptoms of sin are far worse. It's far more corrosive. Our sin, my sin, your sin, separates us from the God who loves us, the God who created us to be in His image. Our sin makes us unable to dwell in His loving presence. Paul tells us in Romans 6 that the wages of sin is death. That's physical death, but also spiritual death. It separates us from God. Jesus says that he hasn't come to call the righteous, but sinners. You see, the good news is this, that that sin that separates us from God, that sin that it merits the punishment of death, that sin was taken care of by Jesus. In his death on the cross, in his glorious resurrection, he defeated the power of sin and death. He overcame it and he offers us to join with him. To be in Christ through his death and resurrection to be saved from our sins. Jesus tells the Pharisees that he hasn't come to save the righteous but sinners. I don't think he's actually talking about the righteous, for Paul tells us in Romans 1 that there's no one righteous, no, not even one. What Jesus is saying here is that he hasn't come to call those who think they have it all together. Jesus hasn't come to call those who think that they can save themselves. He hasn't come to call those like the Pharisees who thought that they were okay, that they acted good enough, that they said the right words. He hasn't come to call those who are, who are good at, trying to be good enough in themselves. He's come to call sinners. Those who recognize that without Him there is no hope. Don't get bogged down in the details, but it's kind of like this. When the governor or the, the president pardons someone, they can only pardon someone who has been convicted guilty of a crime. And sometimes, when, especially when the president pardons someone, sometimes those people will not accept that pardon because they don't want to be seen as even possibly have been guilty for that crime. Friends, when we come to Jesus, we don't come before him as saying, I've done my part, now you do the rest. When we come before Jesus, we're not saying, God, I'm trying my hardest to be good, so I hope you'll be good to me. When we come to Jesus, we come to him as sinners. As people who acknowledge that without him we have no hope. Without him there is no hope of heaven. For we can't be good enough on our own. The Bible tells us that all our righteousness, all our good deeds are like filthy rags in the presence of God. Friends, Jesus has come to call sinners to repentance. If you've been in church long enough, you've probably heard that word repentance means to, to turn around, to, to stop going one way and instead turn and face the other. And yes, that gets kind of at the idea the word repentance in Greek is a compound word. It means to think with. To think with. To repent 
is ultimately to think with God, to agree with God that our sins are evil. To repent is to agree with God that what we are doing is against His design and His nature. To repent is to agree with God that our sins separate us from Him. And to instead turn from those and pursue Him. Jesus has called us to repent of our sins and trust in Him. Friends, Jesus has not come to call those who have it all together. He hasn't come to call those who have put in their best effort and are trusting Him to do the rest. Jesus has come to call sinners. Those who recognize their need and put their hope completely in Him. Today, we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus. We celebrate the fact that Jesus' death was truly satisfactory, that His death covered all of our debt, and we know that it fully covered us because He came back from the dead. Not only did He pay the price for our sins, but He defeated the power of sin totally and completely. So I don't know where you are today. But I can tell you that if God is calling you, He's calling you like He called Levi. To leave wherever you are. To turn from all those things that you were doing to try to save yourself and instead to cling to Him and Him alone. Maybe you're here today and you find yourself thinking like the Pharisees being judgmental of others, thinking that that God couldn't save those people because they're too far gone. Well, today I want to invite you to repent, to trust in God because He will forgive you. John tells us in his first letter that if we confess our sins, He is faithful and righteous to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Maybe you're here today and you realize you don't know Jesus. Maybe you've been in church and you've heard these things your whole life, but you realize that you have never turn from your sins and put your faith totally in Him as Savior and Lord. Well, in just a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to stand here as Trace comes and sings. I want to invite you to come and, and share that with me if you put your faith in Jesus for the first time today. I don't know how else God might be calling you to respond to His Word, but I want to give you that opportunity. Would you pray with me this morning? Lord, we thank You so much for the call of Levi. Lord, we thank you that it shows us that our salvation is not based on what we have done. It's not based on our good works, but it is based totally and completely on your grace and your mercy. Father, forgive us when we forget that. Forgive us when when we (laughs) just forget that we are saved by grace and that everyone else is saved by grace too. Lord, if we have had pharisaical hearts, Lord, would you forgive us? Help us to, to know that and to repent. Lord, I pray for those in this room that don't know you. Lord, would you draw them to yourself? Would you give them new life by your Spirit? Help them to turn from their sins and trust in you. Lord, we thank you so much for Jesus. It's in his name that we pray these things.